Hello guys, welcome to the intellectual experience. Alright, uh, this is, we're going to dive straight into this. This is Bragia part two. Yeah. The in-depth part where we don't have to do the whole, you know, on the surface mm. type thing. We're just going to dive right into it. Yeah. Right, and we kind of got into this last time, but I really want to know, um, because we're both obviously coaches, if you yeah. haven't watched the previous episode, um, what do you think is the most effective thing when it comes to just um, training in general? So, so like, I, I mean, like, oh, you, you obviously have, you, you know, in training, you, you can do drills, you can do, uh, you can play, you know, games, you can play this and that. Like, what do you, what do you feel like is the most efficient and the most, and the best way to train a player? Well, you have to, like, differentiate between, like, the two main types of exercises or, like, two groups of what you want to concentrate on is either technique or like understanding of the game so when it comes to technique I think like the most effective way to make a player better is either with like the El Rondo if you know that of course yeah like one or two people chasing in the middle and a circle around or a square around that tries to keep hold of the ball. Um, so that is like maybe the best, like in general, uh, yeah, the best in general way to maintain the like touch of the players and the close control of the ball. But when it comes to like improving a player's overall uh, ability in the game, I think the closer you come to like the real game in the types of exercises, the better the drill is. Because if you, for example, want to play out from the back, you have to replicate those types of game situations in the training drill and just try to like make it almost a muscle memory for your players. And the drills have to be as like as the game so i think the most important thing is to make it yeah more like in game stuff so i like to have maybe possession drills or to really to show players how to think for themselves they have to have game-like situations where they can do things without thinking of the consequences you have to be able to solve uh, a problem without thinking of the consequences and then you like move on to like uh, a phase where you have consequences and then you have to make the right choice and then you have to make the players understand what you want them to think but also make the players be able to like understand that they have to think for themselves you as a coach can't tell your players in the game what to do but you can lead them in the direction of thinking that makes them much better players. If you understand. Yeah, yeah. yeah you know, you know I, I just totally agree because that's always what I'm trying to do, what, like trying to implement into my, um, I, every like regime I, I produce yeah. is the closer you get to the actual game, yeah, the better in most cases that is, right? There's obviously, I, I do see some value in, in just taking a million shots from, you know, a free kick position, right? But uh, it's not that efficient, that is. Y you do get better, no, just, you know, don't get me wrong, but it's going to take a lot more hours to do that than just actually do um, closely related to the game drills, right? Uh, and then I tried to implement, like, like like for instance, like every time I go to the pitch by my, by myself, yeah, like, I'm not really taking free kicks anymore. No. I'm I'm trying to just a simple jog before and then run because the difference between shooting with a ball rolling and a free kick is bigger than you'd think, right? Yeah, because you have to be able to maintain your balance while you shoot, right? Yeah, and you have to, to practice actually hitting a target that is rolling, so just make the ball roll or run with the ball a bit before you shoot is a massive difference and will 
yeah, m- make the possibility of maintaining or improving your ability much larger. Yeah, and and and, and but, but uh, you you said about consequences, right? Yeah. Like, what do you put into that? Well, for example, w- we had in s- some training sessions, we had like a drill where you just play in your own half and try to split into two teams where the goalie starts with the ball and you want your team or def- the defensive team uh, with like defenders and the central midfielders to try and play it out from the back and have maybe like uh, being like a one up or two up when it comes to th- the amount of players because it's easier and uh, easier pressure, and then you up the pressure to be more and more game like. So, for example, when the centre halves has the ball, or like yeah, the central defenders has the ball, they in in like the beginning of the drill or like using the drill. They have don't have a lot of pressure. They have a lot of time on the ball, and then you increase the pressure. You increase the opposition amount of opposition players, right? Then every move you make will have a lot more consequences, and you have a lot less time to a lot less time on the ball. So just upping the pressure um, and upping the opposition will make it more important to being able to think for yourself. But when it comes to consequences, it's also like you don't need to keep score of things, for example. You just have to incorporate everything into their mind. So if a midfielder knows that he has four opportunities uh, and one of those is very risky, but it's the best solution, in the beginning, you want them to take the risky solution because that makes them a better player. I want my players to fail on the training pitch as long as they do the thing that makes them better because failing is a step in the right way because you've done something that you don't normally uh, or something that you don't normally are going to make or going to do. So being able to do the difficult things and trying to do the difficult things makes you a better player. So therefore, you have to start without consequences, uh, make the possibility of doing something risky without the, like the pressure of the consequences leaning over you is a good way to like uh, improve a player's thinking. If you understand me. Yeah. So, so, so you just you just kind of you just kind of let them do this. Let them try it out carefree, and then you eventually uh, put in more and more boundaries for them to basically fail. Yeah, for for example, because that's the concept we were talking. We're not talking about actually like whooping somebody. We're talking about like you know losing the ball, right? Yeah. For example, when I start with this training drill, where you just have to play that from back, Mm. I won't say I give them like one instruction of like I give them the positions they have to play right because that's normal. And then I say, yeah, you have to play it to the center backs first. But from then, in the start, they have to think all for themselves. They have to think themselves. Which means that, and also I tell them, there's no consequences. Do what you think is right. But then they either will fail or do it the wrong way, mostly. Because they don't know what to do. Because I haven't told them. So the thing is that you first start with just seeing what they actually can do and how they think, and then you intervene, say what your actual plan is. For example, if you want it to go out to the fullbacks, then into the midfielders, you tell them that after they've done the mistake of playing right into the middle, losing the ball and go against. So... You have to put some pressure on them to make the things themselves. But after they fail, you have to, uh, yeah, give them the, give them the guidance to not make the mistake mistake again, and see, and make them think that oh, so 
I should not play like right into the middle. If there's three players in the middle, I should use the wide players and then get into the middle again. Uh, so I think that being able to think to, for yourself, you have to be let loose in the start, and then you give will be be giving more and more guidance for like the narrow the thinking will be. If you get me, because you have to let them get a general understanding of the play style, and then you get more and more into the details and how you do things. So you have to make them just, you have to make sure they, that they can think for themselves in the start, and then you try to guide them into what's right and wrong and stuff like that. Yeah, so, so you, you kind of let them fail. You yeah. Let them try, you let them try their own thing, and then you eventually, I mean, if they do it perfectly the first time, <laughs> there's not really much you can do, right? But that doesn't happen. But if they do it perf- perfectly, yeah. tell them, okay, you did that right. Yeah, okay. Now yeah. show me do, show me how you do it again, five, six, seven, eight times. Mm. And they will fail. And they will fail. And if they're not failing, it's a, ah, we Gucci. But then you add just more players to the opposition team, which makes it harder. And gives them consequences. Yeah, yeah. You have to make the potential of the consequences be bigger and you have to make them or like the chance of something bad happen be bigger because then everything becomes more risky and every every decision a player takes is more and more important. But yeah, I thought something you said. Yeah. No, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> I, well, <laughs> I was going to say something, then you asked me a question, but yeah. All right, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 but I thought it was something. Yeah, because it's nothing wrong with, like, failing, uh, but the only way to know what's right is to know what's wrong. Right, yeah. So you have to fail to know what you're going to do right. So that's why, for example, you have practice games before the season, because you have to know what wrong you do for example, we have just had one practice game with our team because of Corona and stuff like that. And we won, but it was a shit game. We didn't do what the game plan was because we haven't had enough practice of doing that. And of course, you can have like a small pitch on the training field and you can tell them exactly what to do. But when you come to a game, everything suddenly changes because they have to think for themselves. So, for example, I saw... When we were going to play out from the back, we gave them instructions. But it's hard for them to understand what we show on a tactics board and incorporate that into the game. So they start to stress more. Uh, they start to think what we said to them and they don't think for themselves. For example, it was one example of like we met a team that was like, wasn't pressing us very much. They were like, the team was almost like in their own half when we had the ball with the keeper. So what our players did was, as they was going to do, they played up to the center half and then up to midfielder. But the midfielder then had lots of space behind him, like towards their goals. But he didn't turn. He played back to uh, the center half because he thought he had he didn't have much time on the ball because when we do the training drills he don't have much time on the ball because there's like more intense pressure so instead of like just turning around and taking the ball with him he just played back passes all the time and this is a really good player normally but he he did that because we had only shown them the scenario of teams that was pressing high. So when the, the team started pressing low, they don't know what to do. So that's why we need to do game-like training drills so that they know what to do, but they have to like be able to think for themselves. We have to tell them that you have to look around you before you make a de- decision because we can't, we're like, we know, I don't know what you call it, um, like we can't see the future. Future, we can't see what the opposition team is gonna do. 
you don't have the resources to do that to do that. So we need our players to be able to think for themselves, to look around, to see where the space is, what space to use. And that's what we try to like achieve in the training drills. But we also want like it's no biggie when our midfielder just plays a back pass to the center backs and we start again. But we want him to turn if he has the space to turn. And of course, we we do the hardest hardest types of opposition on the training drills. But when we meet an easy opposition, we have to know what to do then as well. And in that practice game, we saw that our players are not that good at playing against a not that good team because they don't know what to do when they have too much space. Yeah, but would you say that the team is bad just because they don't press high? No, but it wasn't that. It was that, like, I wasn't... It was not a good team because they was like two people that was pressing high and the rest of the team lay back. And we went like, we scored after some around four, 40 seconds, I believe. So we could have won, we won 6-5, which was shocking. <laughs> <laughs> like we had an own goal. We had a lot of stuff that, like most of the goals we conceded was our own mistakes, which is fine actually, because now we know what to work on. But it wasn't a good team. It wasn't a bad team. But we saw clearly that our players were much better than them. We just have to be able to like fully maximize the potential of our players and guide them into knowing what's right to do. And, and when you see that, you want the players to think for themselves. I feel like there is, um, I, I feel like there's this boundary which you don't want to cross when they think too much for themselves. Yeah, when they start to stress about exactly, overthinking. and then and then and then also just when they don't are in that position, when they don't follow the plan, when they don't, when they're not a part part of the coherent team, right? Yeah, because and like, where do you draw that line? Well, as I said, it was like one player that's probably our best players uh, our be- one of our best players um, as midfielder when he gets the ball when they're playing out, out from the back when the opposition team was like pressing low was laying low he didn't know what to do because what his what our instruction was that if you don't know that normally you have to play back to the center house and then like play it over to the other side of the pitch and like try to play play it out and play it easy. So when he hears our instructions, he thinks, ah, the coach just said that we have to do this and this, so I have to do this and this. But when you like overthink and don't think basic football, you have you do those mistakes where you're like Oh, our coach said this, so I can't do anything else. For example, I played a game in a cup, I believe, uh, and one of my teammates, you know, him, you know him. Okay, right. Yeah, former striker. He was playing fullback, and, and almost never played that. So before the game, our coach said. Yeah, you haven't played fullback. You have to do the, do this and this. And one of the instructions was that you have to follow the winger. But what he did was that he rather follow the instructions of the coach before the game than the instructions from me as a goalie in the game that could see what happened in the game. So what he did was like laying out with the winger when the game was on the other side of the pitch. So the space between him as a right fullback and the right center half was massive because he didn't he didn't follow the the rest of the game or like he didn't follow the rest of yeah he didn't follow the game and he 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 was not he was not coherently in the team he was no, no, no. he was out of sync N- yeah 
he 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 was that odd one. Yeah. Right, and and that was a problem. Yeah, it was. It was a problem. Because. Uh, well, yeah, it's a problem because when he doesn't listen to me as a goalkeeper. It, okay. When he doesn't listen to me, who actually sees what's going on, he, when he gets so obsessed about following the coach's instructions, it ruins like the team, the functioning of the team because um, one of the important roles of the goalkeeper is to tell the defenders what to do. And when the defenders don't listen to the goalkeeper, he is incoherent with like, like the main goal of team being a team that is to give instructions to each other. And when what the coach said before the game matters more than what happens in the game, it's a real problem because then the opposition can like use those flaws to expose you. Yeah, right. so, so, so there you have a problem with him not thinking at all for himself. Well, it's both that he isn't thinking for himself and that he's overthinking. He's so obsessed with doing things right and following the like the instruction of the coach. So he thinks about his position all the time and doesn't follow the game and doesn't listen to others. So it's both that... He isn't able to like think for himself, but it also is that he is so obsessed about thinking for himself and listening to what was said before the game that he isn't able to listen to others. So it's like, it is a sort of like paradox where he thinks too much for himself and has this one instruction stuck in his head that just goes again and again and again. And that defines how he plays the game. And isn't able to like understand what he has to do, right? And, and sh- shouldn't the coach really be saying that to him? Yeah, but like it isn't that massive, because I think maybe we can see that one goal because of it. But the coach won't will maybe not notice it, especially if we are don- dominating the game. But me as a goalie will notice it, because I'm obsessed with like. Communicating with my backline because I need them to be in the right place, so it much, makes it much easier for both the backline and me. So, I think that's like the point of like the dimensions of teams where you have like to have the captains, you have like the leader of each part of the team, you have a leader in the backline, you have a leader in the midfield, you have a leader at up top that has to. And, you know, like understand the game from inside the game uh, in a way that the coach can't. So I think it isn't really like the coach's responsibility because it's hard to like see clearly. But I, from my perspective, which is much better than the coach because as a goalkeeper, you almost see everything, especially behind the back line. I see it as a huge, like a huge threat, but the coach maybe won't see it as a huge threat because we have the ball most of the time and he focuses on that. And then a small, a small run in, in defense, defensive positioning, it's not that big of a deal for him. Right. Yeah. I, 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 I think I uh, don't want to understand what the fuck you're saying. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard. It's hard to describe when you like can't draw or anything. Or anything but yeah, we yeah. we don't have the resources for that here. No, the no, no, intellectual no. experience. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be smart to listen to this. It's an intellectual experience. Yes. Which means that you have to be able to picture this in your head. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, the intellectual experience. The just experience. so you know, uh, that's it. it's a long story, but at the end, it kind. If you Google this, I do believe it's, you know, when you finally realize something, mm-hmm. 
You know, like when you, oh, I didn't understand Newton's law, and then all of a sudden they just click. That's that's an intellectual experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's like the whole point of this, mm. right? Just like a funny side note. Yeah, it's funny because you are the host of this. <laughs> no one will ever realize something while listening to you. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But I will be getting a lot of intellectual experiences. Right, that's the whole point. Well, yeah. So, uh, for you, for you guys who don't know, I'm mostly an attacker. Mm-hmm. I mean, I haven't really played in like three years or something. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I'm still. I'm. That's because of injuries, not because I'm not playing. Mm-hmm. Um. So I'm. I'm still like you know training and being in team and stuff. But I'm, I haven't played an official game in like three or four years now. Yeah. <laughs> Shocker. But do you think? I mean. As I was saying, I, I'm an attacker, like just about anything offensively, and you're a goalie, yeah. right? Because you don't really play anything else, do you? No, I right. played like fullback until I was like 14, and then I yeah, right, was like full time goalie. Yeah, right. Yeah, and do, do you think that you have something to contribute that maybe I don't have, or maybe the midfielder doesn't have? I mean, ob- yeah, but- obviously you have you know the, the goalkeeping drills and like the goalkeeping things, but do you think that you it, like overall, do you think that you have something to contribute that maybe I don't have, and then vice versa? Well, in like the old time that I've played football, I've had a different perspective. Like you have been much closer into the situations. You have, you could, you can like have a good overview of how your team lies and how it pressures the opposition teams and stuff like that. But I've have had that those like that perspective so that means that probably i can have like a one-up on you on how a team should like position be working together and right? position themselves yeah, and yeah. stuff like that but you have a one-up on me that you are much more knowledgeable on for example on the ball experiences one-on-one duels how to do stuff with the ball to create more space so you see, for example, with coaches, most of the coaches today are either center halves or central midfielders because they have the best views of what, they have the best perspective and best view of what is going on around them. And I think also goalies have that type of like understanding of what's going on on the pitch, which I think is like a contributing factor to how I understand the game and how I can teach it to others. So, yeah. I'm also kind of seeing strikers nowadays as coaches. Well, I mean, it's it's not purely... Yeah, if you like see a top s- level, s- for example, chef. you have Frank Lampard, Steven Gerrard. Frank Lampard? Yeah, but like, he, he was... <laughs> he big, was... Um, you have, for example, I mean, you have Sin- Sinan. 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 Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, Sinan. And you obviously have, I mean, Perlo now. Yeah, Perlo. 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 And then you have, uh, wait, wait, wasn't Klopp? Uh, Klopp was a fullback. Was he, oh, really? Yeah. Oh, and they have and Guardiola, he, he's, he's a midfielder. He, he's a midfielder. Yeah, yeah. And then you have uh, Solskjaer. What is, yeah, he was a striker. He was a striker. But he did play like wings and all the way. Yeah, yeah. but maybe yeah, striker. And then you also have like Insagi. He's also a striker. But Insagi isn't a coach. It's his brother that's a coach. Really? Do you know that? It's Simone Insagi. Oh. <laughs> Pippo Insagi is like the legendary striker. Dude, dude I, I've always thought. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, he, he's the Napoli. No, no he's, Lazio. That's it, right. Yeah, yeah. Because Gattuso yeah. is Napoli. He was at Yeah, he Milan. was Milan. Yeah, 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 but right. he is also a central midfielder. Yeah. Okay, right. And, then, and yeah, I just I, I I always thought that Insagi was uh was the Insagi. But because it's not the case. No, but Simone Insagi, which is the manager. Yeah. He is also he was also a professional player, but he's the brother of Pippo Insagi. Mm. But he's the legend. He's like he's a legend, yeah, but yeah. <laughs> he is. He, I think he's too dumb to be a coach. Oh, okay. not no, no, but like the way he played. Okay. He wasn't like the like the technical tactical masterclass. He just he was always in the right place at the right time. Like Holland, for example, hmm. he always knew how to position himself. 
but I know I don't think it's become a coach out of him. You, you, you know, you know, I said that it's basically just Socha, and then it's midfielders. Yeah, just Mourinho was a goalie though. I mean, b- b- was he really playing at a high no, level? No, but Nuno Espirito Santo, the Wolves Wolverhampton coach, he was a goalie yeah, at like a medium high level. Oh, okay. And he's like a good. Yeah, and and and, and Klopp, like how how do you? What, did he even play in the, in the Bundesliga? No, playing the second Bundesliga, I think right. a bit in the Bundesliga, but right. But he 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 wasn't really at. Well, of he, course, like when he was a full, if he was a fullback, you understand the way he plays the game, because, like, he, he plays the type of play that involves the fullbacks in, in like the attack. Yeah. So it's <laughs> typical, like. Um, former fullback wants like the fullbacks to be more involved in the attack and play and stuff like that and you have I think Bielsa was a central midfielder as well right. yeah because he was like successful as a central midfielder in South America I'm just going to Google it right now I'm just going to I'm just going to look, look at this real quick what are you looking at? I'm, I'm, looking, I'm, just, I'm just straight up googling um, uh, I'm just straight up googling uh, players who are for, uh, former players who are now managers, right? Yeah. And I can just about see. Well, if you list like the managers in the Premier League, I can probably yeah. tell you if they're former players. Right. And you also have uh, Vieira. He's also yeah. a centre. Uh, you, like, you're absolutely right. The, and you have like. And uh, wait, Ronald... Solari? Santiago Solari. Yeah, he was a central midfielder. And then you yeah. have. Uh, Ronald Koeman, which is who is at Barcelona right now, yeah. he was a central uh, central defender. Uh, but you do have Henry, even though he isn't really that he, good of a coach. He's a shit coach. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he has no, but like Vieira as well has not had any success as a coach. But uh, hasn't he been slightly better? Yeah, he he was because Henry was just like. Uh, he fell right, right into right. Monaco, yes. failed straight away. No, 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 no. He he was actually the assistant of Belgium. Yeah, and Holland. then right into yeah. like but his first managerial role yeah, was he, that. He, he went kind of too. I think he went too quickly into yeah. into his managerial role. And I think after that he was at Vancouver, Whitecaps. Wait, Henry. Yeah. Okay. And then I don't know if his. I think he's at Nice now. Because Vieira was at Nice. But now I think Henri is at Nice. Really? You know, I'm... Wait, I'm just going to wait. Uh, Vieira? Mm-hmm. Okay. Vieira. Okay, there's going to be a lot of good cooking go- 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 here. Uh, Patrick Vieira. All right. What I'm seeing here is... He's... Formerly been training Nice. Yeah. Until 2020. And then there's nothing after that. No. He was hacked. But he did pretty well at Nice, I believe. Yeah. I, I mean, he was there two, two years. You, you don't really stay there for two years unless you're doing something right. Yeah. But I do believe <laughs> Henri was one, one done. Yeah. I, 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 because now he's back at being a football expert. Which yeah, yeah, for uh, for Sky, Sky right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I believe. I'm gonna look at this real quick. Yeah, yeah. he's uh, no, he wasn't at Vancouver Vikings. He was at Montreal Impact. The other oh, oh, wait, isn't he still that though? Yeah, he's still at Montreal Impact. Yeah, but uh, what even is Montreal Impact? If we're if we're, if we're being really honest here, like really raw. Is it barely it, in that MLS? I think you can't respect anyone that is in the MLS. Wait, I'm just gonna it, it's like where they ended up. MLS is like a parody league. You can't like check where they ended up because it doesn't matter how you do on the table. It's like the MLS finals that matters. Oh, uh, here's when I'm Googling the team, it's even saying. Oh, Victor Van Am was actually playing here. Mm. Uh, it, it's actually saying Wilfred Nancy. 
with, with Nancy as the main coach. Yeah, I think. <laughs> so what is Henry doing? What is, what is Henry Probably doing? Quit. Do you? Th- I mean, it doesn't really say here that he quit. He might be just being a part of the coaching staff. I don't know. Yeah, I'm. I'm not even seeing them on the table anywhere. Oh wait, here it is. All oh, right, this new season, so yeah. <laughs> it doesn't really tell me anything. Yeah, but it. We're being really harsh, but isn't even Montreal isn't even in the US. It's in Canada, right? Yeah, it's Vancouver Whitecaps and Montreal Impact, which is like, and Toronto, Toronto FC. Uh, is it Toronto FC? Yeah, it's just Toronto FC. Oh, and I'm look, looking at here. It's just Toronto. Yeah, Toronto. Yeah. You know, it's kind of funny as well. Is isn't there, isn't there a thing that uh, New York City, like the New York team? Is playing in New Jersey. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. New York Red Bulls is playing at New York. But oh, right. New York City is playing at Yankee Stadium, which is in New York. Okay, right. It's in Queens, I believe. Oh, okay. Yeah, Yankees is from Queens. Yeah. So New York, uh, it was always funny that like New York Red Bulls were playing at New York because that's in New Jersey. Yeah, but I, th- I think Red Bull needs that branding. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Yeah, but what are your thoughts on the MLS? The MLS, yeah, to be honest, is like, I, I it, it's like, it, it's like a cemetery for yes for European players exactly. But if, I, I think it's the premier cemetery. If that yeah. makes sense, like no, like, no, 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 like the, it's way better the, than China. The, it's way yeah, better yeah. than China. It's way better than India. It's way better than like Saudi League. It's 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 better than anything in the East. Because like, where else do you go to die? Really, it was like the first. Like it was cemetery. the first center, yeah. Yeah. and then like the Australian league came and yeah, Del Piero that... and Robbie Fowler went there, but then it just died out. Yeah. And then the Indian league suddenly came, mm-hmm. and then uh, the Chinese league started playing yeah. because now the, Chinese the Chinese league, league yes. was like playing or like buying South Americans. Like I remember Daraconca. Uh, totally, totally unknown. <laughs> Argentinian was like one of the best paid players in the world oh, because yeah, yeah. he was playing in China. And then they started like buying uh, top European clubs. But it was mostly like South Americans, like Oscar Ramirez. Mm, uh, it didn't even like Tolisca and Hulk. Yeah, Hulk, um, Alex Teixeira, stuff like that. Yeah, and Tolisca. So yeah, yeah. It's, it was mostly like, for example, Carlos Tevez and stuff like that. You know, it's like Lavezzi, didn't you go? Yeah, Lavezzi. Yeah. Oh, he was paid a lot. He was paid a lot of money. Have ha, you seen like the picture of Lavezzi at like a team presentation? No. He, he, he made like these Chinese eyes. He stretched out his eyes and was like really racist while he was playing in China. I'm going to go players who went to China and see like what pops up. Because, oh, oh yeah, Carrasco. Carrasco. Jesus. And then he went back to yeah. Let's Go. Dude, that's kind of unheard of. And then also Witzel. Dude, yeah. Witzel, dude, I, I'm so surprised with Witzel. <laughs> he went from the Russian League to China, which is like a death sentence, right? Yeah. Because, I mean, he was... He but, was like, all right. but he he and Hulk he, both did that. But he managed, like, both ran from, like... Yes. Witzel went from Benfica to Senate, and Hulk went from Porto to Senate. And then they... So they both... Firstly, start chasing the money while by be- going to Senate, <laughs> yeah. and then they went to China, which is even more money. Yes, but Whistle managed to, like go get back, uh, like get out and go to Dortmund and actually succeed. That's the ultimate hustle. I'm telling you, that's like that's like peak because then you, you get in, get the money, and still have a great career. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like could you imagine in Ch- you're in China getting paid loads of money. And, and, he, and he even got he even got bronze at the World Cup with Belgium yeah, in yeah, 2018. Yeah. I I I think that might have might have like been his like his his card into Dortmund. I I just think that without his World Cup. Yeah. I mean that's that's, that's like kind of the magic of the World Cup. The, mm-hmm. you just like unknowns become go, like from rags to riches. Like that's like what happened to uh, Hamas. Yeah. You remember? But like or like Kaylor Navas or whatever. But. Yeah, but that's that's like well, we're into players cemeteries, right? But I think that is a lot of fun with Chinese. League. For example, have you seen Hamsek? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, yeah. great player. Mm. Went to China. Now he's at Gothenburg. Gothenburg. 
I don't know Is it Sweden? Yeah, Sweden Really? He went to Sweden usually Really? It, like, it was big, big deal in Sweden So it was kind of fascinating Like Mark Hamsik Like maybe two years after he left Napoli He's in Sweden Oh Jesus <laughs> Oh, right oh, Okay, I'm, I'm looking at this right now You also have uh, Igolo one. Yeah, he actually came back to United. He came back on loan. Jesus, dude, that one felt great. He even took, even took a pay cut, but like yeah. you know, he was always going, always going to. Oh, Paulinho, Paulinho, dude, that dude, that's the weirdest thing. But like, he went to China, and then became a better player. But yes, only on the national team. No, 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 no. He, he he was fairly good in Barcelona, wasn't he? Oh yeah, he went to Barcelona. He went to Barcelona. Barcelona. Was I do believe he was, he was pretty good. But it was, it, it was it's fascinating, like... And then he, he was back straight afterwards, like, what the fuck are you doing? But, like... What are you doing? He was pretty good at, like... Wasn't he, didn't he play for, like, at, Tottenham? Yeah, he was pretty, kind of shit at Tottenham. Yeah, he, had, yeah. he had, like, one back heel goal that was, like, amazing <laughs> at Tottenham. Whoa. And then he went to China. Yes. Then he became better and, like, was really good at the 2014 World Cup and the Copa Americas. And... Also was playing really well at the 2018 World Cup and then got signed by Barcelona. But I think the Barcelona deal with Paulinho was maybe just like money laundering. Because he was bought by Barcelona for like 40 million euros and went back for 40 million euros. So I think it was it was some, more some, some, some kind of some, 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 some kind of like promotion for the Chinese League that we're not that bad. And Barcelona maybe earn some money on it as well. Dude, I'm looking at these players here. There's a lot of them. Look, Mikel, yeah. Modeste, Alexander Pato, Bakambu, mm-hmm. right? Hulk, obviously. We talked about uh, Oscar. But it's not many, like, European players. Yeah, it, It's mostly yeah. South Americans, yeah. Africans. Yeah, yeah. agree. And then, like, some European players that was not that successful. So it's obviously a hustle to just try you're, to get as much money. Obviously, going there from for the money. Yeah. Obviously. Oh, even Ramirez. Mm-hmm. And Lavezzi, obviously. Yeah. But M- also, Moscherano, Moscherano. Yeah, but like the biggest like deal was Oscar. Yeah. Because he won when he was. He was he, in his prime. He, he was like 23, 24. Wait, was, he wasn't he like twenty five? I don't know. He's still just like 20, 29 Really? Right now. He's yeah, pretty he, young. Yeah. He. He he went like really early. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and he was really good. Mm-hmm. He scored like goal. I think it was the quarterfinal in Champions League where like bang it top corner, and then went on to like win the Champions League with Chelsea, I believe. Oh right. Oh wait, I'm looking at this. I did. This is an interview with Oscar. Mm-hmm. He said, "Um, I was." I was talking to big clubs from Europe as well as Shanghai. <laughs> he's saying, he's saying there was Atletico Madrid, uh, Madrid, and then there was Juventus in, in Inter Milan, AC Milan, and then some other options. But I opted for Shanghai. <laughs> That's like, that- but like it was, it's the same bullshit. Like every player when he comes to a new club, he says like, uh, it's always been my dream to be here when I was a little kid. I always well, like for example. When Hamas Rodrigo was signed for uh, uh, Everton, I think what? Oh, okay, yeah, he, he yeah. said like, yeah. uh, it's always been my dream to play for Everton." Such Bullshit! Such, such rubbish! Bullshit! <laughs> He's never even thought of playing for Everton. <laughs> he pre- played at Real Madrid, but his boy or dream club dude, was dude, dude, like, dude, if 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 you would have if you would have put Everton on the table when when he was signing for Real Madrid, he would have left. <laughs> he he would have just punched you in your gut. It won't spit out of that contract. Yes. And <laughs> to be honest, and I mean, we obviously don't know him, but that, okay. And the other one, did you remember Otamendi when he went to City? Yeah. I remember there was this, this, this like legendary meme where it says, it's been a dream of mine since I was a small, since I was 12 years old or like six years old to play for uh, Manchester City. Yeah. And then there was like, they were in like the football league too at that yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. And it's just such rubbish. Yeah. It, it's, <laughs> but like it's a scam because thing. like people yeah, I'll, I'll pe- just, people found that. out like yeah. a player had said like free interviews 
the same thing. Mm -hmm. That was like his boy dream to play yeah. for exactly this club. Like, <laughs> why not just say like, uh, I really want to play her. Uh, I saw that's a good option. I'm really excited. You have to don't. Yeah. You yeah. don't have to like yeah, make up like lie yeah. because everyone knows that no people are like none of like South Americans over the age of 30 no knew what Manchester City was when yeah. I was a kid so what like why say that so no, no player like Gabriel Jesus is probably the first player that had maybe possibly wanted to play for City when he was a kid no player older than Gabriel Jesus that's playing at City could have dreamt of playing at Manchester City. It's just common sense. Exactly. And now you have like Foden who's like, yeah, you can gen you can genuinely see that he... Yeah, but he's like a local lad. Yeah, of yeah. course. Yeah. Of course. But for example, Gabriel Jesus, I can understand it because mm -hmm. Rubinho was playing at Manchester City when, in like 2008, 2009. Mm -hmm. So I can understand that, but like Aguero didn't dream of it. No. He probably dreamt of playing for Atletico Madrid. And he played there, but he was chasing the money. The money, yes. When he went to Manchester City. But that's like the best kind of money where you're playing in the Premier yeah, Could yeah. you imagine going to the Premier League for, for the money? But like people were talking like <laughs> um, when Newcastle was being talked about talked about being bought by, by the Saudis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're thinking, oh, uh, people can go to the Premier League for the money and playing in bottom of, bottom of the Premier League for the money still playing in the Premier League mm -hmm. like fuck coming fifth in like the league uh, where you can play in the bottom of the Premier League but earn tons and tons of cash like Mbappe would probably, probably like want to play for Newcastle more than PSG if they pay the same <laughs> it's that fucking like ridiculous yes yes because, yeah, because, because I, I, I think the Premier League has something really special and he, he, like League One, League Un, uh, probably the correct pronunciation, Ligue, like La Liga, uh. League Un, uh, right? Uh. And then you have like La Liga, and I mean, the Bundesliga, even like, even like La Liga or like Serie A, Serie A kind of has, it doesn't have anything similar to it, but like it kind of, like, it's more similar than the other ones. People don't pl dream of like playing in the Serie A, they dream of playing at Milan. Yes. At Inter Milan, yes. at Juve, because like everyone born between between like uh, nineteen eighty five and nineteen ninety five, will possibly have a dream of playing for Milan because they were so good at the late nineties, early two mm. thousands. Both of them were pretty good. Yeah, but mostly uh, yeah, AC, right? AC Milan, yeah, yeah, yeah. because like with Maldini and Shevchenko and stuff like that, when he won like three, two or three Champions Leagues. They were immense. And Van Basten as well, right? Yeah, that was late 80s though. Mm -hmm. But like... Yes. And now they're... I mean, for the last like 10 years, they've been kind of shite. To yeah, of honest. course. But like, they, they've been kind of good this year. They, they won... I think they won like they Syria, won uh, in the 2012. Yeah, I think that's With the Allegri. Time. But that was like the last time. I yes. remember that... Allegri won the Serie A with AC Milan. I think that was when Slatan was there and yeah, he lost his one. It used also. to be like it used to be like it didn't used to be like uh, AC Milan was like every other year. Maybe it was like this this dueling between the Milan and Inter. Yeah, in the start. Like the yeah, teams, between so between like two thousand and five and two thousand and ten, because you've had like this big doping scandal. So, Which between like... Down, down to the lower league. No, it wasn't no, was no, 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 no. It was a that, doping scandal. It was thing. mass yeah. fixing scandal. Yeah, that, okay. But yeah, then they went to the Serie B, they lost players and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So, between like 2005 and 2010, AC Milan and Inter Milan so sort of swapped like winning titles and like won it every other year until like Juve become like Big, big the dominant force. It There's was no other way of putting it. This the dominant force. It's, it's like wa watching Norway and consequently skiing. Like yes, for like PSG is less dominant in the Syria than Juve is. 
No, less dominant in the Liga than... Yes. Was, that is. Now I think in, in it's going to take take uh, the trophy home. Yeah, Belil is leading the Liga. So like, Wait, really? Yeah. Oh. They're leading by three points. They won, yeah, three won points. against PSG in the, in the weekend. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. And uh, Monaco won it like three years ago. Yeah. That, so, dude, that was special. Yeah, and that Bappe, was special. Bakioko, like the whole Fabinho, team. Oh, that was another Foucault. thing. That was another thing. When people just talk rubbish, I just distinctly remember this that um, Bernardo Silva. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He, he, he was like, oh, if everybody stays, I think we'd do something special. And then a week left. later, a week later, he's, he's off to, to mm-hmm. City. A week. Chase the bag, dude. That's chasing the bag, dude. That's no integrity whatsoever. But like, I mean, I mean, how you, how are they going to top that? Yeah, exactly. Like they won the and they league. Got far in the Champions League. They, they got they really be, far in the Champions they League. They made the semi final in the Champions League, I believe. Like you, you can't top that. And the owner of Monaco cashed in a lot. Yes. Uh, the players went to better clubs. Everybody won except the manager. I had to stay with like this shit team. <laughs> Only good player was like Jerry Tillmans, and he be, didn't he became good. No, he 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 was shit at Monaco, and then right. we went to like Leicester and became really good. Yes, he was really good at Anderlecht. I mean, it, it didn't Falcao stay, and then uh, the goalkeeper. Yes, yeah, Suba said Falcao yes. and, and Moutinho and Click. Yes, they stayed. stayed. Moutinho went like a year later to Wolves. Yes. Falcao, Falcao is well, now a God knows where he is. <laughs> I think. I also think. Dude, Glick, after his career, after the match, the United move was just horrendous. No, because he saved it with Monaco. Yes, correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but after that though. Like, like he, he's really a bumpy ride. Yeah, because... He was, a, he was the best in Atletico. He was, like, the best in the world. He, he won the Europa League two years in a row with two different teams. And he was the best player at those teams. He was, like, immense. He was so fucking good. I just, I just remember him at Atletico Madrid, and he was like, there is no competition for this guy. He could score with his foot. He could score with his head. He was really yeah, yeah. good with his head. And there's just no stopping him. But like, but now long-haired Falco is like yes. one of the it, deadly it, it, striker to exist. Yeah, or no, because you always have like uh, 2013, 2014, uh, Luis Suarez at Liverpool. He was the deadliest striker to yes, exist. Yes, that didn't win. Help like, though. like they didn't win anything, did they? No, but like <laughs> Suarez against Norwich in those Liverpool periods you know that he was gonna score hat trick he scored from the fucking midfield yeah I, I just i just distinctly remember them almost winning the league they were in like the second but place. like i think suarez scored 34 goals no 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 he scored 31 goals in that 13 14 season when it came second and he was suspended for the first six games because he bit Ivanovic. Oh, yeah. And he still yeah, became a record goal scorer in the Premier League. He was that good. Yes. And he had like, on, he had like, had like around 14, 15 assists as well. Him and Sturridge had 50 goals in between them <laughs> in one season. It was like the best attacking duo you have ever seen in the Premier League. And then he had like... Ali Sissoko and Martin Skirtle as the, def- the defender nurse. Of course, <laughs> they didn't win the league. They had Simon Mignolet in goal. Of course, they didn't Jesus. win the Premier League. I recall that. But this, this is really in depth. We yes. really, we really is like in depth of of the co- yes, coaching it, stuff it, right now. Yes. But it's still, it's fun to talk about. Yeah, of course. These things. This is this is the most fun part, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I, I, Shit talking. Yes. <laughs> All exactly. kinds of you kind of have to do. You have to kind of have to have these moments. Yeah, of course. Like really go into depth. So, before we go into the, some serious shit, I, <laughs> wait, wasn't it after that? After Suarez left, uh, because he he bit, he bit uh, Kirine. Yeah, he, it was that summer. Yes. Because in 2013, 2012, 2013 season, at. In the end of the 2013 season, he bit Ivanovic. 
which meant that at the start of the 2013-2014 season, when Liverpool was that good, he was suspended for like six. He 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 got suspended for like ten games because of the biting. Mm-hmm. So he was suspended for like I don't know it was six or four games at the start of the season. But then, like a year later, he beat <laughs> Chiellini <laughs> that was in the World Cup. Cup. Yes. In the group stage. Yes. So unnecessary. No, it was was he? No, it was the not the quarterfinals. No, no, it it, it it was definitely in one of the finals because I remember yeah. the same World Cup. He was such a cunt. I remember mm-hmm. hating him so badly because. Do you recall when he saved? The ball with his hands. Yeah, that was 2010. T- Wait, that was 2010? Yeah, it was oh. the seventh uh, oh, quarterfinal because that was against Ghana. That was before he went to Liverpool. Oh, right. I, 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 I thought it was the same. I thought it was the same. No, place. but okay. it's, it's fascinating because Barcelona bought him after he bit Chiellini. Yeah, well, was it like a bargain price? No, he they bought him for like 70 million euros which he was worth like 120 yes. at that level which but he wanted to leave yeah it was a bargain but he was i think he was suspended for like four four months yeah at I, service season yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I recall he 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 got this time-based ban yeah so, so he had to play with the barcelona b team why no he wasn't allowed to play like i think i remember like the I he play with the co- b team I think... Or he trained with the B team or something. Yeah, trained with the B team. Yes. But I remember he um, got the offer of training in Kosovo because there wasn't a part of the UEFA because it was such a new country. So, like, as a PR stunt, like the Kosovan Kosovan, um, FA said, like, oh, Suarez, we're not part of the UEFA, so you can come here and play with us. We're not part of FIFA. And it was like a big joke, which was quite funny, but like he was out for like I won't think it was about like three four months. Yeah, no, like wasn't it wasn't it six months yeah, six. in total? For like from basically, I mean it was also in the summer, so they they did. Yeah, I I think some time went there. Yeah, but I I just dude that was that's one of the no, it's not really one of the biggest scandals, but it's a huge one. I remember defending him because he was Liverpool. What? So I, Alex said, ah, oh, he just ran into Killian. and he oh, was right. unlucky and stuff like that. <laughs> and then I saw the video because I hadn't, I just read the news, like, yeah, you, because you can't so, someone said, like, uh, Suarez has bit someone again. And I was like, ah, uh, no, he probably just ran into him, like, first time. I saw it, like, oh, yeah, he just ran into him. And, like, and then I saw, like, he just, just tried to bite off Killian's shoulder. And I was like, well, okay, I'm glad Liverpool sold him. I, the thing that always get me, gets me when I'm watching that uh, clip is when he bites and then Killing just turns around, he just looks towards it, just screaming for obvious reasons. <laughs> and then he takes his teeth. Yes, and then he's like, oh, my teeth hurt. Jesus, <laughs> my, my, like, you know, he just he just holds his teeth. Why, why the fuck do you hold your teeth? Yes, because, exactly. like... That, that, that thing, like, always gets so you, funny. You just admit that you bit someone. Yes. And then, and then, wait, please correct me on this, but I just recall the referee didn't believe him because he didn't see it. So yeah, he, he didn't. Killian, like showed him the yeah, bite Killian, marks. like did like this. Yes, he, he's he like pulled showed. his shirt, shirt like over his shoulder and show the bite marks. Yes. but you can't if you don't see it. The referee can't do anything. Yeah, this was the pre VAR days. Yeah. So, so so didn't he like finish the game? Or yeah, am I just totally? But, I'm gonna totally an idiot now because I, yeah, but they lost to Italy, I believe. That uh, might be true. Yeah, I think. Either that or Suarez, he was suspended from that game either way. Oh. But I don't know if they lost or what. Yeah. But that was, he was such a cunt at that moment. He was the biggest cunt. I, 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 I still remember how like much I just hated him. But he's like the player that you hate to play against, but you love to have on your team. Yeah, like Diego Costa. Yeah, yeah, Costa. Or like Vardy. I, I, I think... Well, I think Kane is that type of like cunt. I I'm, because I'm, everyone I'm hates. Not the, I'm not. I'm not getting the cunt vibe from Kane. Well, everyone started hating him because he like ran into like 
had the duels and just like dives basically he jumps into people and gets free kicks but injures opposition players and I think every everyone at Tottenham like loves him but I think a lot of opposition people hate him a bit because he does some country shit and a bit because he's a really good player same with like Bruno Fernandes because he has dived and he scores a lot of penalties people hate him you're right, you're right, except like for my United fans same with Salah Salah is a really good player everyone every Liverpool fan like loves him but every opposition fan hates him because he dives and he does many f- shit a lot of shit that like is not good but yeah yeah okay, okay, I can kind of see that but I, I'm not really getting that vibe from Kane I think, I think I think if, if, like if, if you go if you go fights. if you go on like football Twitter, everyone hates him because it's a typical move that Kane does when there is like an air duel where the balls is balls in the air and it drops down, and the player go opposition player goes to head it. Um, Kane just like backs into him. Uh, so that the player that is jumping up to head the ball is like jumping into Kane, does like also almost a front flip and lands bad. But Kane always gets the free kick. So everyone is pissed at Kane because he does that every, every time. And it's dangerous. So that's why there's like a building hate against Kane. Also because he talks like this. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think now we can kind of go back to what we're really supposed to be. Yeah, I I, get, I think I can do like an introductory question. Introductory question. Question. What? Who is like your coaching tactical idol? Jesus. If you if you had like base how you set up your tactics. Who would you like, who is your idols or who do you take inspiration from when you look at your taxes? Is it like some famous coaches that you think of? I mean, it's, you, you can't really talk about coaches without naming Sir Alex. And I'm a United fan, obviously I'm going to look at Sir Alex, right? And you kind of see his, his um, you kind of see his memories and like his ways in today's Manchester, obviously, with uh, Ulgen Zosha. And uh, I wasn't really old enough to really, like, look into his tactics when I was looking at the game because he retired in 2013, I believe. But, like, it's Charles so, Ferguson has never been, like, famous for, like, this extraordinary tactics. Yeah, but... He, he's the best totally man, man best manager, man manager yes. ever. yes. But when I try to think of like, yeah, but he, he he had he had those he had those things that you know like counterattacks. He made yeah, yeah. a counter attacking team. But when I think about like Sir Alex, uh, Sir Alex's players and stuff like that, it's counters. It's a really a world class striker, obviously. World class striker. He and goalkeeper but, always, always. Yeah, but like strikers. he played like pretty basic, like keep the ball, make counters set a high pressure but it was like anything revolutionary when it comes to comes to tactics i believe same with like wenger you, you, he was they both was revolutionary in their own ways but they wasn't like coming through with this like extreme tactics like Simeone, guardiola klopp pochettino bielsa mm-hmm. all of those they they're known for like their tactics but Sir Alex and Wenger is known for like yeah, man, 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 man management yes. and stuff like that. Yes. Uh, in when I'm looking at football today, I really enjoy. Uh, I'll be honest. This might sound stupid, but I enjoy the way United are playing, and that the principles they're playing. I mean, the the. Trying to quickly divert here, they have a really huge habit of just playing poorly, yeah. and then they concede, and then they play good, right? And just you, you just don't want to see, and that's why I'm. It's not 
the only reason why, but that's why I think uh, that they've come from behind so many times this season, like r- almost record breaking many times. It's because they just, they just, I, I don't know, I'm not going to tell you, but they, they just play horribly, just in general. And then they uh, concede a goal, and then they just, oh, wow, let's just play good, and then just do that, right? And from, from what I'm seeing, it's like a 4 2, it's a 4 2 3 1 with high pressing. If it's really high counterattacks, that's what I like to see because that's fun and it's engaging football, right? It and he also to be to be fair to him, he's also uh, he knows thinking through about tactics, which is not which is something he's been really working really hard to prove, just because he didn't really have that before, like he didn't really show that before. But when you see when you look at games like the City games, Liverpool games. PSG games, even even against uh, not the most recent uh, Salzburg, but like the the previous the first Salzburg game. Leipzig. Leipzig, sorry. Yeah. And he did great against Tot- uh, Pochettino's Tottenham yes, as well. Right. So so y- you do have things where he can straight up just implement things like change like two or three five uh, one two or something, where he just demolishes the uh, opposition, but. In all in all, I think it's, I, I'd really enjoy the way Solskjaer is playing. And I really enjoy Klopp because I've been watching Klopp since his Dortmund days because I was I was a Dortmund fan from like 2012, 2013. That was like when I really started supporting him. And that's, you know, really high intensity, a lot of running, and not really dominating the ball as much, but dominating the space. Like as as far as my as far as my um observations go, right? I might, I might be a fucking idiot, but that's that's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing that they don't necessarily. I mean, now they just dominate teams straight up. They have a lot of the ball, but they don't need to have a lot of the ball. And you, you can see that really early on with um when Liverpool were not title candidates, but they were still playing City. That City are really comfortable holding mm. the ball. They're really comfortable holding the ball. They're also really comfortable letting the other team get to the, like the midfield and then just win the ball really high with pressing but, with really intelligent pressing that is but then city when they met liverpool they had to like boot it far because yes they couldn't handle the pressure yes be- was, because from what i'm seeing that club does he's really good at this is he basically because he's occupying the space he's not really up at the ball right so from from what i'm saying I might be a fucking idiot. I'm just, you know, really starting out. But he forces the opposition to make mistakes by taking out all of their options. But I think I, I've seen Liverpool live once on the club. And what okay. he does in the like the high pressure okay. is that they use like something, something called pressure traps, mm-hmm. which lures which always gives the opposition two, three, two, two or three options. Yes. Uh, two for options. There's always one player that is uh, open, that is in a bad position, and then is is it is the option of booting it far. Exactly. So what Liverpool, especially in like prime club days, what they did was that they made the opposition play to the player that is always available and then and they then keep they... on pressing until uh, they let one player be available mi- in the middle of the field I saw that when under Liverpool Everton the 1-0 game when Origi scored at late goal that was a fantastic <laughs> game but what it did was that Idris Gay was suddenly totally alone were like 10 meters to the nearest opposition player in the middle of the field in his own like in his own half but then when he got the ball he they just swarmed him yes they just swarmed him yes yes so they make they let the opposition play until they found find the alternative that is in the bad position, and then they swamp it. Exactly. So, so they, they just they it basically just give you limited options. They they control where you're supposed to go, yeah. and then they they just zoom in on that and they take every option mm-hmm. away, 
enforce the mistakes. Yeah. Right. And that was like what I was trying to explain earlier. Like they, they're not really pressing all the time. No, no. They're just like very intentionally, very intelligently, very intellectually. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's way more, you know, you might look at it and you, you just think that it's random, but it's so not random at all. And, and that's like one of the special things that really took the Premier League by shock. Mm. I mean, he wasn't even really, he wasn't really that good in the beginning, but like last season especially. But like he shocked the Premier League when he came to the Premier League because there was like this five four games stuff like that, and nobody, nobody knew how to handle the pressure. But he has such he had such a bad team yeah. to manage in the first in his first season yes. that yes. he so couldn't like incorporate. He, 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 he couldn't really win win no, the league no. by then, so he, he had to like build that a couple of years. But like you can see that uh, Roberto Firmino, for example, extremely good at pressing, and I don't know if it's just that Firmino is really good or Klopp really changed him. But Firmino in his prime is probably one of the most intellectual and the best pressing best pressing striker ever because he was so smart in that like the way he pressured the opposition he was like it was you could like write a master's degree on just Firmino's types of pressing <laughs> he was he was like his thinking was like phenomenal mm-hmm. it was like out of this world how he pressed like especially in that season when Liverpool came second one point by City uh, 17, 18, he was so fucking good. And, and 18, 19. Yes, goes. and one of the things that uh, kind of put him apart is, you know, he's obviously a very intelligent presser, mm-hmm. but he's not the most dangerous in front of goal. No. So therefore you see Liverpool, the wings are really the ones who are scoring like, but like Mane and Salah really the way the way Liverpool plays is they have three very intelligent forwards that is quick on their feet, technical, and to some some degree good finishers, which means that all three in the front trio in the front trio can play in every front trio position, so. They have like this ability to like swap places and see what uh, see what like suits the opposition. For example, I remember like a West Ham game where Liverpool like sh- like just shit on them. <laughs> well, what it, what it did was like they found out that West Ham was weaker on one side. So what it did was like just Salah went into the middle. Um, uh, Mane out on the right and Firmino out on the left. None in the like natural position, just because it suit suited the opposition less. It was worse for the opposition to defend, and the the ability for players to be able to play in several different positions is such an important trait. The versatility. Yeah, versatility and flexibility. So that is probably one of like the main reasons why Liverpool with Klopp has been successful because they have players that suit his style when it comes to versatility, workload, and other things like that. And and that's why I mean, and for the reasons we're talking about now, that's why I really like him as. Yeah, manager. of course. Everyone should like him because he's <laughs> he's yeah. good. Like for example, what, but everyone. He, okay, yeah, go on, please. Everyone loves like Sir Alex because, or everyone has like taken some inspiration from him because he's a legend as yes. well as Wenger as well as so much, so much success. Yeah, so like you can say what you want about Klopp, Guardiola, Simeone. But you ha- and Mourinho, but you have to like give them some credit and understand that they're just good coaches. That's it. Yes, in their own way. Yeah, yeah of course. Gee, I was just about to, 
what am I supposed to say? Uh, yeah, one of the, I don't know if, if I'm just really stupid, but I, I feel like Klopp also kind of revolutionized uh, the league in terms of fullbacks and what fullbacks are capable of doing. Yeah, because first, first it came with Klopp and the fullbacks. And then Guardiola as well. Yes, and showed now- how. But what Klopp did is how you like. Guardiola revolutionized the league first when it came to fullbacks and how you can involve them in like the middle of the pitch when it comes to play, having the ball and stuff like that. When he used midfielders as fullbacks and he drew like he drew them into like he dragged them into like the center of the pitch while Klopp showed how you can use fullbacks as an extreme attacking weapon and how if you have the alternative of two fullbacks that can go on the overlap time and time and time again it's a really dangerous weapon and when both of your fullbacks end up with plus 10 assists in a season you have revolutionized the league in some way. So both Guardiola and Klopp revolutionized the league when it comes to fullbacks in its own way. Yes, and I feel like the whole... Because he basically turned uh, Trent and Robertson into nuclear bombs. Yeah. He basically he just weaponized them so intensely that the teams were just marking them instead of... I mean, that's really far-fetched, but... Well, they some... were really, really aware of the just the lethalness of the of the of the fullbacks, which is not really yeah. it's been unseen you saw in for, years. You saw, for example, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer did that with Trent Alexander Arnold and Robertson. He put like wingers very defensive to like mark them, and it ended like nil nil, I believe, in the game. But I remember like Ole Gunnar Solskjaer really really like focused on like marking the fullbacks as well but what's fascinating is how Klopp made fullbacks that important with three players up top that is like 175 175 and 182 and not the best headers yeah like Salamane and Firmino Mm. that is like None of them are like the greatest headers, but they score time and time again with crosses. Like, for example, Jota, small player, scored two crosses. Or not, yeah, no, he scored one, one header against Arsenal. But like, the importance of just having Trent Alexander Arnold to like whip it in to a small player, it doesn't matter how big the player is as long as the cross is good enough. Mm-hmm. And that's what Liverpool showed with that team. Yeah, I think it's just really amazing, like what he did in, in terms of the, just the fullbacks. Mm-hmm. It's because I I just don't remember them being that important before, but it's because now you you really you don't really see teams that have their fullbacks staying behind while attacking they're almost always really close to the attack or in the attack making runs you know you know like overlaps and stuff um so you don't you don't really see those really defensive fullbacks anymore and there was i i would say that there was attacking fullbacks before i mean you obviously have like marcelo and 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 uh with the carlos and, and stuff right steve bruce yes right and Steve Bruce, like the former United player, had like I think he had twenty goals and or like twenty goal involvements involvements in a season as a fullback. Right, it was immense. Right, so so, so it, it it wasn't really that. There's nothing really new about the whole fullbacks being really, uh, but those are more individuals, right? He made he made that as a system, you know. And, and he, he he kind of made Trent into this kind of right right back. Um, 
he, he basically does the same thing as a center tackle midfield, but he's also defensive. Yeah. And to be honest, you, you know, the fans are probably going to hate me saying this. He's not really that good at defending. Well, he has like... <laughs> he's not really yeah, that good no, at defending. No, no, but like, it, it's fascinating because you can see that in some moments he really shits bad. Like, for he example, really yeah. shits in the bed. Yeah, but like, for example, <laughs> with Real Madrid. But what what Klopp has done in the Premier League is not just revolutionize the fullbacks, but has revolutionized the way you use center backs. Because if you just push up both your fullbacks, you have only two center backs left in right. defense. But he has shown that if you have quick enough, calm enough, and strong enough central, central defenders, it's okay. They can cover for your fullbacks. Your fullbacks can have some like flaws when it comes to defensive positioning and one-on-one defensively. But as long as you have good center backs, for example, with Van Dijk and, and Joe Gomez, it's okay. And Claw, what do you mean? Yeah, come on. <laughs> but, like, but like, you don't need two center backs. We, no. If you have either Ragnar Klavan or Nate Phillip, Nate Klavan. Phillips, you you sort of you don't you don't concede goals. Yeah, but they are the best defenders of all time. Ragnar Klavan, <laughs> and Nate Phillips. Yes, obviously. It's it's of it's like the biggest. No one can say anything against me, but like Nat Phillips is the best header of the ball in the history of the football football game, obviously. and Werner Klavan is the best dribbler ever. Yes, obviously, especially dribbling players <laughs> that are not there. Yes, he's really good at those. <laughs> like, like, did you see the Real Madrid game yesterday? But like, Nat Phillips did a Werner Klavan. He just turned around to play it to Allison, and then he said. Nah, I'm not going to do that. And then turn around again with the ball just rolling in front of him. So he just turned around, <laughs> around the ball twice. And then like, nah, I'm just going to keep going with the ball. So he just did it right in Klavan. So you see, legends <laughs> are made, but Liverpool don't yes. have any yeah. more center backs. Yes. <laughs> legends are made. <laughs> Dude, but I, like, I, I, he, I watched the Darwin game, by the way. Yeah. Le Borussia Dortmund. Uh, but <laughs> legends are made, dude. It's hilarious. Yeah, and and yeah, but I, 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 Jesus. <laughs> I also also see that they also have midfielders that can get into the defense. Yeah. So it was to cover for the. the it was time. more that they were like forced, but like Fabinho is a former fullback. And Henderson played fullback a bit when he was younger. But I think the thing about like Liverpool's fullbacks is that they have pace and strength and they know how to do know how to like approach one on one duels. So for example, Van Dijk is like he is like a unicum. A what? Uh, I've, we in Norwegian we call it a u Unicum. Unicum? It's, yeah. It's like a one in a mi- one in a million player, like right. he's totally unique. You can't like copy him. For example, you saw that um uh, Manchester United tried to do the same thing with Maguire. Maguire. Yes. And Maguire is a good player. But he's not worth seventy million nope. because you have like the only players that can do such things like Van Dijk is probably Ruben Diaz and Amir Laporte, um, uh, Sergio Ramos and Rafael Baran, mm. because they have those, they have that mobility, they have that calmness, they have that they have the creativity, speed, they have that strength, balance, just yeah, and just defensive prowess, yeah, and strength. Yes, really important. And yeah, Maguire is a good defender, but he's he's, he, he's too not slow. He, he's too slow. He's not that like he's mobile. Not agile. No, he's not agile. No, he's, he's not mobile. He, 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 he's a moving fridge. That's what he is. Yeah, and he <laughs> he does too. He he's good on the ball, but yes. he is not good enough when it comes to defensive positioning. 
Like, for example, he is good at, like, blocking the ball, making good blocks, but you see him time, time again losing his man. And you can say, for example, I was, like, kidding a bit with Nat Phillips, but it, in that Liverpool-Royal Madrid game, he was great at blocking shots. He came, like, he was positioned correctly when he was blocking shots, stuff like that. But when the game goes very fast, he becomes out of position because he's not good enough and he's not fast enough. And I've seen that the same with Maguire. When the game and the tempo is so high, he falls behind because he's not agile enough and not quick enough in the head, even though it's massive. Like, I think maybe, like, because he has such a massive head, <laughs> the nerves don't transfer, like, information yeah, right. quick enough. Yes, yes, So he obviously. can't think quick enough. <laughs> he can't do anything about it. He just, he's too big. It's natural. It's he's nat- natural. Yes. Yeah, and, and, and that's why it's really important in United's case to get a somewhat speedy attacker with a lot more, way more athletic, that can make up for his... Yeah, because... Speed, I guess. <laughs> if if you get, like... You have... But McQuarrie is, like... he He's really good with, like, type... Uh, Johnny Evans type, which he had at Leicester. A smarter, maybe not that physical type that can direct him and cover for him. But also, you see that when you get that quick and du- aerial duel type player that can run up and like cover for him, like Eric Bailly, it still is chaos because none of them has that quality when it comes to thinking. Like, for example, I think that Lindelof is better with Maguire than, than, than what uh, Bailly suits Maguire. Okay. Because Lindelof is calmer, He's better on the ball, and he reads the game better, easily. And he is more of like that Johnny Evans type player that Maguire needs. So the problem with Maguire is that he isn't... You can't define him as like one of two types. He's like in the middle. That's why it's hard to match him with another player, because he's not that Van Dijk type. That is like calm, strong, and like a leader. He's not good enough for that, but he's not like the Joe Gomez type that's just really fast, good at one on one, that can run up, run up everyone, and like cover, cover every defender. So he's like in the middle, and that's really hard to like solve the problem because he's. You want to like combine two good players that fits each other, but you can't fit Maguire with a lot of players because you won't get the total package. You just want you will end up with one and a half and not two. You want a one plus one, but Maguire is a one that is half of both, so you will only get one and a half either way. If you get me. Yeah, I, I can see what you mean. And and I feel like I feel like when uh, Bai is not busy getting injured or getting a red card, I, I feel like he can be a real asset. Right? And it's still chaos as you see, but I, I've we we don't really see that combo just because he's always injured yeah, and, yeah. and for obvious reasons. But I do believe there's thorough potential yeah of in, course in that if he gets he can really start playing consistently and then because Maguire he's really vocal he's a good captain mm-hmm. right Captain Franklin captain for I, no isn't Kane captain for uh, Kane is England captain yes but it's fascinating because like yes. you have the Liverpool captain the United captain as what they were captains or, like, you had, like, Henderson, who was, like, the captain of Liverpool. But then they chose Kane, who wasn't even captain. 
Yeah, at Tottenham funny. as the England captain, and everyone was like, Woo, what's happening? Yes, but yeah, Kane is the England captain, right? Yeah, and, and just to go back on my point, like Maguire, he's from what I can tell, he's he is um, a leader, he, yeah. he knows really what, what he's doing, and I've if 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 there could be a really dynamic, yeah, funny, huh? If if there could really be a dynamic where he can kind of, I'm not gonna say boss around, but if there could be really like, if they could really cooperate, yeah, and be really in sync, that they could be a lethal duo. Just yeah, because by fills in the gaps for Maguire. Yeah, he covers for him. And the same does the same goes for Maguire because yeah. because by it's not really the ones. But he's not the one who's going to take the long pass, the f- nice curve to hit the right winger mid-run, right? Mm. But Maguire can do that, at least sometimes, right? But, and same with Maguire, he's really fast. He's fast, yeah. right? So you know, you're not going to see Maguire sprinting and, t- and running up on the, full, on, on the wingers, right? Yeah. Or the striker. But you're going to see Baye do that. Mm-hmm. Right, so where Maguire comes in short, by can fill that gap, but that is, it's just too hard in my opinion for to for the hat to happen just because he's not playing, he's not getting his playing time, he's all always injured, and he's just he he's kind of too volatile. He he doesn't really yeah. he's not cool. He's not no. cool at all. Like he we. We have friends have a joke. He's a living yellow card. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Which is, in my opinion, really accurate. I mean, if you look at his stats, I don't think I don't... He, he's like a walking tackle. Yes, he's a walking tackle. Exactly. So, so, yeah. I I do believe United need another fullback. Yeah, of course. I I I, I truly believe believe that. But you're not getting rid of Lindelof because he's really solid. Mm-hmm. But. I, I feel like you need somebody next to Maguire that as well, which has speed because Lindelof is not fast enough. No, 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 okay. He's not fast enough, but he is good on the ball. And Wambasaka and Shaw is not fast enough as well. I, they're not. They're not. I fa- want to say. Well, I yeah. want to say fast enough. I want to no, say. No, but like, I'm talking about if you ha- you have two slow defenders. Yes. You have to have you one really, 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 really sp- speedy fullback. Yes. Um, Shaw is like. Okay, pace. Mm-hmm. Wamsaka is fast, but it's not like really, really, really fast. Like, for example, Robertson is extremely fast. If you look at him in games, mm-hmm. he can, he can like he or like he's not fast. He's quick. He can do <laughs> those like twenty meter extremely dashes. Yeah, but like you have like Gomez and Van Dijk that is quicker, quicker like faster than him on the like a fifty meter run. But Robertson is really fast, like the first twenty meters. So I think that having like a really, really fast or like quick fullback that can like cover for the like center backs if they're really out of position and can't run up the strikers is a really valuable asset. But I, I think f- for United, like Maguire is like. The Matip type. Uh, okay, I I didn't really know Matip. No, but, but okay. like Matip is like he's big. He can win head of duels. Uh, he's not slow, and he can run fast in like long distances, but he's not agile enough and not like smart enough. And like, or like he's smart enough, but he's like he's not agile enough. He's not too too mobile. And he can do things with the ball, just like Maguire. But the thing is, in Liverpool situation, when everyone's healthy, even though Matip maybe is better than Joe Gomez, you would rather play with Van Dijk and Joe Gomez than Van Dijk and Matip, just because Van Dijk and Joe Gomez suits each other that well. So either you have to find the perfect fit for Maguire, or else maybe Lindelof and Bailly would fit better together than Maguire and Bailly. I don't know. But sometimes, like, the balance of the team is better than including 
like the star player. But of course, if you have a captain, you can't just put him on the bench if he doesn't fit the team. You have to build a team around him. So I think like United is like in a bit of a hassle on that note, but they're second in the league. They're not conceding that much. They're doing great. So I think it's like more of like a perfectionist type answer from me than or like a perfectionist type for more than like a really big necessity to like find the perfect like center back pairing but I don't know yeah I, I can I can kind of like uh, see what you're what you're on to mm. and you're also a goalkeeper right and I, I have, have I've had really big I have a really I've had a really headache all thinking about David David Gea well I don't know because David Gea has always like been a tricky person for me because I've never liked him the way he plays or like sometimes I like him but he's always to me seemed like the underlying perfect goalkeeper just like for example Oblak I think him and Oblak would much rather play in a Simeone Mourinho type team than in a Klopp Guardiola type team because they're not good enough on the ball they're not that good at sweeping and for example in like the to- total opposite is like Allison and Ederson which is really aggressive always out good in like aerial duels in the box for example like corners while De Gea and Old Black is like really good at reflexes, good at quick saves, stops some days, like, every shot. But as a keeper, goalie, goalkeeper that really likes, like, offensive and aggressive goalkeepers, I've always thought that De Gea has always been a great keeper, but he's never been, like, close to perfect for me. Like, for example, when Ellison and Allison came like broke through and really came onto the field you could see that i thought that if i was going to build a dream team that is the type of goalkeeper i would include not the Haya, because the Haya isn't like you want a goalkeeper to be an 11th man if you get me you want him to be involved in the play you want him to be an asset when you have the ball but De Gea is more like you play with um, uh, you play with uh, 10 players when you have the ball and 11 when you defend, if you get me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I see, I see what you mean. Hmm? You're looking at your phone? <laughs> well, yeah, it was like... The, um, Staying at home? Hmm? St- you you uh, going home to dinner? <laughs> no, it was uh, another coach that we're. I think we're sharing like this, like <laughs> you know, like this uh, closet type thing where you hang, what? where you put your balls and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. We I think we share with like Oscar Lehmann's for a team and <laughs> I would uh, and yesterday we uh, we had a tr- training and I um, I threw out a lot of balls from like the ball net because they were uh, not enough air in them so you can just have a little monologue because I have to answer him. <laughs> okay. Yeah, right. So, um, to, to me, the fact that uh, De Gea hasn't really... The fact that what what's really gives me the headache is that, to me, it's a huge difference between 
pre twenty eighteen at pre World Cup twenty eighteen the girl mm-hmm. and after and post yeah twenty eighteen uh, World Cup the girl right there is this huge discrepancy in in the, just the players it, it, to me it doesn't really look like the same player it doesn't feel like the same player it doesn't it, it just I might be an idiot. I might be. I, I. I am an idiot actually. But I might be. You know, if you look at the stats, it might be not be that big of a deal. But to me, there was a noticeable drop off from before and after the twenty eighteen World Cup, right? Mm. And more specifically, before and after the first game versus Portugal, because yeah. the fact that Ronaldo got that hat trick, mm-hmm. like two of those, go- no, like. Um, at least one of those goals, I know for sure, was not something pre twenty eighteen to get would no, let no, it. Okay. Never in my existence would I would I have anything that thing right, and just nowadays he makes like just silly mistakes. Yeah, of and course. It, it, might, it might be because I'm older now and I can like see through the the bullshit, but I just don't remember him before twenty eighteen making those really just silly just unnecessary mistakes. Yeah, and and. And not not that he's become like a, a mingle or a car or something, right? But y- y- you know, just like not, just, I don't even know what it is. But he's he's just he's just not at the level. But uh, he was undoubtedly the best keeper for like a couple of seasons. Mm-hmm. Like like Neuer was up there, but like he was the Bet- best between like twenty sixteen and twenty eighteen. Yes, under Mourinho, yes. he was peak peak extremely good yes and he was also do, and like you know you could see him kind of building up because ferguson got him in and then you know you could see him like because he was making delicious there's no other than he was making delicious saves right and you can like he was making mistakes then as well like really in corners and stuff yeah but he wasn't he might have been making the mistakes he's making now but I just don't feel like he was. And there's a reason that Real Madrid wanted to pay, like, a billion dollars. I mean, not a billion, but, like, you know, <laughs> like, like yes. He was going to be, like, the most expensive goalkeeper by a mile, right? Mm-hmm. And, and you know, they United gave him a contract, a really big contract. He'd like, he's, like, the best paid player in the team now, basically. I think just about. I, 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 maybe I, I, Pogba. I no, 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 no. I, because, th- because there's a salary cap. Yeah, you know, so like, I think there's Pogba, De Gea. I I do believe De Gea might even make more now, but anyway, yeah, yeah. Alexis Sanchez is probably one of the best player players players at United still. Yes, they probably <laughs> pay that much of his salary still. Yes, but but uh, he, he um the, the, the thing about I mean that's a whole another rabbit hole I'm not gonna dive into. Yeah, but you know you know I have this has a salary cap at like I think it's three hundred and fifty thousand yeah, pounds a week. Yeah, I probably. think that's the limit. I think De Gea is getting that. I I do believe that. But you know they gave him half. They gave him like the best the best money they can offer him mm-hmm. like in, in their current um um you know contract uh, situation and structure. But after twenty eighteen. He's not. He's not horrible. No. He's but he's not the world's best. He's not no, been no. near. He's like, Pog. Pog is Pogba Pogba's same thing? I I'm not sure, but you know pre pre United Pogba and post United Pogba, <laughs> I don't feel like it's the same player almost. No, no, no. And it's same thing with the guy. He, it's just I don't even know what it is. It, it makes no sense. Like, but like I think... now he should be back to normal, but he isn't. He he's. You don't really mention De Gea anymore when it's supposed to be like, oh, who do you think is going to be the toddy uh, t- team of the year keeper? It's always yeah. like Edison, Allison, those Neuer. Type, Neuer type of guys. Neuer's kind of Tristan starting again. to fade away. Yes, yeah, but Neuer has been great and Oblak, this year. Oblak, Oblak. Oblak. Oblak, yes. But like, I think it has something to do with De Gea's star of play because I've always thought that, for example, he uses his legs more when he saves stuff. Mm. And I think that has a thing to do with the fact that he's more like he's leaning more backwards than a lot of other keepers, so, which makes it extremely more easy to, or uh, uh, a lot, le- a lot less hard to 
sit with his feet and be quick with his feet. But it makes for, for example, the mistakes he did against Watford where it's an easy deflection that is on his first post and it just slips through his hands. And maybe it has something to do with Solskjaer with his with his involvement in the game, basically. Because under Mourinho, he had like maybe five to ten shots at him, at him each game to Solskjaer, which presses higher, who has more intensity in his pressure, which doesn't mean that they're better defensively. It just means that he gets fewer shots that is coming from better positions. So maybe it's a style of play thing. Maybe it's just not used to being, being or having to be that focused in those short moments instead of having to be focused through the whole game because he's involved through the whole game. Or it could be a confidence thing because you can see that a lot of goalkeepers, except maybe O Black, always go through like tough patches and stupid patches where they make a lot of mistakes. And that can be just a confidence issue most of the time. So that's like my input on it. Yeah, and, and, and also, uh, I've, I've, I would imagine that, you know, the whole confidence thing would just be over by now. But just, just it's it's been three years. Yeah, it, it, it it's still not the same. But dude. he was pretty good at like the start of the twenty eighteen season. But then he faded away, in twenty nineteen. When like, when <laughs> just when social came in, his dip started really to, like start. He started to make more mistakes. It went worse and worse. And now Dean Henderson is the first team keeper. E- uh, mostly because De Gea is having some personal stuff and stuff like that. Yes, I mean, he, he, was, he was back in the squad and fit and everything yeah. this this Sunday, but he was spared for some reason. Yeah, so I, I, I also... Th- I, w- I would imagine it's Henderson starting um, tomorrow. I would imagine. Yeah. But. Who knows? Who knows? And yeah, it, it, it seems to me that De Gea's end is coming faster than we thought. Yeah, but I think it's like 50-50 shot of his, the spiral just keep going downwards. Like he keeps being in the downward spiral or he makes like this huge comeback and shows again how great of a goal he is. It is like I think it's like a fifty fifty shot, in my opinion. Yes, because we always we obviously know it's in there. We obviously know we've we've seen him multiple times before. Like yeah, he's of r- he's a capable goalkeeper. Like, you know, there's no doubt there. Anyway. Yeah, there's, there's no doubt that he's yeah. a really capable goalkeeper that I haven't dr- you know, I haven't really been that much into um, football until, like, recent years, until, like, the last, like, four or five yeah, years, yeah. right? So, like, I don't have a lot of stories about these great goalkeepers, like, this, this, these great falls from grace, right? Mm-hmm. You know? Like, I don't even know... Um, I, I don't really know anybody else that I might... That has, like, this fall from grace? Yes. Well... I might, I might be if you tell me, but I, I, I not on the top of my head. I didn't really recall like huge from the t- from grace. top of my head. I believe probably the biggest fall from grace in the last like ten years. As will a goalkeeper, be, that is. Uh, yeah, as a goalkeeper is Carrius, but that's just confidence. Okay. It was one game. He had a really great season when Liverpool came to the Champions League final. And then he fucked up in one game, and his co- like it was, it was like he suffered from like he shit the bed. He yeah, but really what? Like shit the bed. He got a concussion. Is during, that real? Yeah, it was actually real. Okay, because that it, Which, like it is like pa- pa- fascinating propaganda. because if that concussion meant that he d- made those mistakes, 
that concussion ruined his whole career <laughs> because he never came back from that. No. He was pretty good at Besiktas when he was on loan after that. But he was never at the same level. And then he went to like Union Berlin, where he is now. And he's the second goalkeeper at Union Berlin. So it is a pretty big fall from grace. I'm certain, I'm trying to think of like yeah, but I, I, someone I, I never else. Thought, I never thought he was like, you know, he was never up. You never, you never talking. He was never in this discussion when we were talking about the best players in the league, no, or like the best goalkeepers in the world or anything. He, he was like, yeah, he's not really that good. But like, he, he, I mean, he was all right, I guess. But I just, you know, I never really thought he was a beast. You know, no, no, no. But I think that there is n- most goalkeepers are like when they have like a decline, it's not like this big fall from grace. It's mm-hmm. like more of yeah, like steady, ste- decline. steady decline. Like yes. De Gea has like had like a steady decline, even though it seems like a bit shocking. It has been like steady. It hasn't been like, oh, he shit the bed and now he's not a first team keeper. Yeah, but, uh, you do have the, the really turning point is yeah. the World Cup 2018. But like, I remember Liverpool using Brad Jones instead of Simon Mignolet against United no one you, you don't know who Brad Jones is nope no that seems how, that shows how big of a deal <laughs> that was because Simon Mignolet was that bad and I've only example I can come up with like a big fall from grace that is like really embarrassing that is not a goalkeeper but like about Alberto Moreno who lost had where James Miller had to play left back an entire season because Klopp didn't want to use Alberto Moreno. That was like a big, big fall from grace. And it's the same with like how yeah, Brandon Williams came through uh, with when Mourinho didn't want to use Luke Shaw because he thought he was fat. <laughs> so it's like, it's fascinating how some like man management is like, I can't use you, so I'm using a... It's random. A pro- probably a poor solution, but I just don't want to le- use you because yes. then the problem isn't big enough to fix. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to just showcase how big that problem actually is and then we'll take the risk of it being actually quite worse when you're not there as long as we get a better solution. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I I can still totally see what you're what you're on, and it's it's way more common for you know uh, outfield players like you know f- to fall from grace just because of, like they're different systems, they're different. Yeah, uh, you know, got a different country, different system, different team, different players around you. Mm-hmm. Like goalkeeper. Y- y- he kind of has less of an excuse because his only job is really just to not let the balls get into the net. But like, but it's still a system, it's still a thing. But it's way more similar than being a striker for. Let's say you're a striker from club, and then you go to a striker for uh, Simeone. Simeone, so, right? It's a huge difference. But like, and and but, but if you go from from Allison to Oblak. It's probably a bit of a difference, but you're still you're still gonna you know stop the shots, and you're just, you're still gonna you know do but what you what you're doing now. The fascinating thing about like the later years is that goalkeepers has become more and more important, and the fact is that it is a bigger impact that you switch goalkeeper types than it was before. But the fascinating thing about like goalkeepers for awful grace, I think. A lot of the goalkeepers that has fallen from grace has like resurrected. Thibaut Courtois, right? Shit yes. at yes. Chelsea. Yes. And now he's really good at Real Madrid. You had. Yeah, he was actually kind of off of grace. Now that you think about it, yes. Yeah, and for example, whom it was one other. Um, uh, Manuel Neuer, he got injured. Yes. And then was out for like two seasons. Yeah. And, was that good. and that. now he's pretty good again. Mm-hmm. Um, and you also have like did you know like Don Roma? He was like really good. When he was like seventeen, and then he but like, like he, he hasn't went back. Be, he hasn't become worse. No, he it's just that he, he was so hyped. Yes, but like I think 
he has over 100 Serie A games he and he's 20. <laughs> yeah. No, he, 21. He, 21. 21, right? Yeah. 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 It just, like, this, this, this meme that, you know, there's always been this meme that he never gets older into 21. No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> God, do you remember him? I, Donnarumma was like six. Like, he was like seven. He, he would play... He, I just recall this. So did, he would. There was a meme. He would play in the Champions League, and then the next day he was he was having his final exam or some shit. Yeah, but I remember. Oh, who was? Yeah, it was Edward Kamawinga at Ren. He's no like seventeen. Is. He, he uh, drove home from a Champions League game, and had a driving lesson. Or the day after he debut- debuted in the Champions League, he had a driving lesson because he wasn't old enough to drive a car. All right. So that's like those like fascinating stories. Yeah. About how young some players are. Yes. And now you have Jude Bellingham. Yeah, Jude Bellingham, Jesus. Ansel Fati, Elias Moriba. Yeah, sto- uh, ton of tons of players that is like super young and very very talented. And it's. It, it's- but the, the, they are not always... I mean, I feel like those... Because now they're really in the limelight, right? I just feel like those players... I, want, I don't want to say often, but they just fall from grace. They just, you know, don't live, live up to the hype or just Yeah, don't. you have... You, sometimes you have, like, for example, Jack Wilshire, who f- fell hard. <laughs> but... There is like, of course, some and cleverly not, not, and also well back. Yeah, but not everyone is going to be like this great mega yes, superstar. Obviously, but it's obvious that with the systems that are now, for example, for like two three years, everyone thought that Erdogan had flopped, and now it's great. Yeah, because he was so hyped in the beginning that. People thought that like his development would just like rapidly grow with his age, but it's natural that his he will have a rapid growth in the ability, and then it will stagnate a bit, and then he will be better after that, which has happened. But like how clubs are run and how players are back these days, it's obvious that Jude Bellingham. That Pedri, that Ansu Fati, that Erling Haaland, all those players are going to be great unless they like tear a ligament in their knee or stuff like that or break a foot. Like they, they are so so good players that they're almost too good to fall off their pedestal. Mm-hmm. Too too big to fail. Yeah, <laughs> or like. They're so good that if they fail, they will still be great players. Yes. That's what fascinating or like was like so fascinating about those players that if Erling Haaland fails from or like goes down from his level that is now, he will be a level that is expected from someone at his age. Mm. So he's overperforming that much that is like, okay. Will like accept that he have to get worse sometimes. Yeah, but it, even if he was to stagnate from now and does not evolve anything, he is would, one of the greatest. He would still, you know, go down in history books one of the greatest of yeah. all time. Yeah, of course, because he's he's so good now that it isn't about Holland becoming better. It's about Holland not becoming worse. Yes, because Holland is at such a high level right now that he can stay like this for the next five years and he will be one of the best tracks in Europe. So it's fascinating. Mm-hmm. Still can't pl- And then you I don't even know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> I got no idea what to say. No. Yeah, uh, it's been two hours. It's been two hours. It's been two hours. I'm looking that, at the that, time. That, that's like four hours in total. It's been one hour, 59 minutes. 
Are we gonna make out an outro? Or what? I, 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 you know, just because it's fun, I think we just stay until two hours. Yeah. Okay. You know, obviously, you mm. can't you, you can't quit when it's like one minute. Away but like, I, I just want to include like something that Joanne Quirth said. Okay. And this is about tactics and all. Like, if you keep the ball in your team, you won't concede the goal. Mm-hmm. That's like the bottom pillar for a lot of a lot of great managers for example Pep Guardiola that if you manage to keep the ball in your team for most of the time the chance of you conceding is so minimal if you tra- if you coach your team to keep the ball as much of the time they can and if they are so good at keeping the ball in the team you almost won't concede you don't need like a Van Dijk or Harry Maguire to not concede as long as you have players that are good enough to play the ball and that's what like revolutionized football when Joanne Cruyff started like playing like the Barcelona playing with the Barcelona team that where they just like kept possession for the entire game almost and they didn't concede so I think I just want to say that like that uh, what like rephrase what he said because that is one of like the most important things for me as a coach to know that I like to say or bring forward to my team that if you manage to keep the ball the chance of you conceding is not big at all but the chance of you scoring is great so you have the cards in your hands and you decide the outcome of the game if you get me yeah i i I fully understand and i I fully agree Mm. and but one of the problems with that is that football is supposed to be exciting football to me football is supposed to be exciting it's supposed to be uh including you know yeah and it's supposed to be uh just I don't know why I probably said this previously, but engaging, right? Yeah, of course. And and you don't really achieve that with just holding on to the ball. No, right? but that is the point of like just being in possession. Yes. Minimize your chance of conceding a goal. And then you work your way from there. Yes. Then you go over to like playing a type of exciting football that will create a lot of lots of chances, lots of goals, stuff like that. So, of course, as a viewer, you want, like, what we call Hawaii football. Okay, yeah. Or, like, Hawaii football, where it just... Back and forth. Back, back and forth, forth back yeah. and forth. Yeah. Like, like tennis. Yeah, like ba- <laughs> tennis. Like a handball match, basketball match. Yeah. Stuff like that. But you, as a coach, you will get heart problems for that, from that. Your heart won't be able to take it. Yeah. So... You have to have some security. You can make it exciting, but your main job is to for your team to have an exciting match, which you will if you keep the ball, and it's for your team to win. That's your two main, two main like, um, yeah, two two main goals you you have to focus on when you go into a game. All that other stuff and training and stuff like that is to development and stuff like that. But in your game, you want to have fun and you want to win. And that's the main focus. And keeping the ball in your team for a long period of time or being... You don't have to like be in direct possession. For example, with clubs playing off and stuff like that. When you control where with your press pressure where the opposition team is placed and how to play, you're still in some type of possession even though you don't have the ball. And that's also like a point of the saying that if you can be in control of the ball, either if you have the ball or not, it's much easier to play the game. Yeah, I, I said earlier, I fully agree with you. And um, I just want to say thank you for coming. Thank you for coming back, actually. Of course. I, I, it, yeah, you, you're my first reoccurring guest. Right? Of course. Yes. I'm a special. Yes. 
an only interesting guest. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Or no, I'm not the un- only interesting guest. You but know. I'm not Oscar Lehmann, which yes. is not an interesting yes. guest. Yes, yes, he he he's obviously an idiot. He's never reoccurring. <laughs> <laughs> Fantasy Premier League. No, yeah, and uh, I was about, what was the thing I was supposed to say? Yeah, you're from reoccurring guest, and um, I just yeah, I, I think I'm gonna give you a nickname that you know a lot of stuff. So I'm just gonna be Mister No Know a lot of stuff. Because fuck you, that's why. <laughs> Dude, I just remember, I just remember the f- like first two minutes. You just like, yeah, I'm here because I know a lot of stuff, and like, yeah. <laughs> well, I I didn't know what to say. Yeah, obviously, I, I'm I'm sorry, but yeah. No, no, no. It, it it's great because it's the truth that you know a lot of stuff. No, but like I, I said that I contain more knowledge than the average human population. <laughs> Dude, that's, but, I think the biggest cunt Yeah, but most people, day. most people do that. Yeah. And I think that my, I think that one of my strengths in life is that I just pick up a lot of knowledge that I won't, don't necessarily need. Like, I don't need to know um what about or what like big mistake Alberto Moreno did in the 2016 2017 season but I remember Correct. it of course you did and then I suddenly can say it on this podcast so I have a big memory and it doesn't it doesn't help me most of the time and the nice thing is that no none of your listeners will hear this because it's I don't have end. any listeners that's why well you have <laughs> listeners but they don't listen the full two hours of yes, the podcast obviously not yeah always not but I don't know I, um, I'm excited for part three when we talk about politics oh. instead <laughs> Jesus politics <laughs> yeah the second you actually get some credentials in politics yeah. that's, that's the day I'm gonna get you on here again I, I have some politics, uh, that is. Okay. We we will see. Yeah, you, you, because you did tell my first episode, right? Hmm? With the politician. Yeah, but he like... Had, he had proper credentials, my guy. It was like proper... Like, now I'm making... Yes. I'm sarcastic, but it's not proper credentials. Like, it's the most proper that I can get. <laughs> well... <laughs> I have con- contacts, like... You have contacts, yes. My yes, brother is yes. like... Hey, sh- 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 we're not going to talk about it. We're not going to talk about it right now. We're not going to talk about it off air. Okay. Gotcha. I just want to say thank you for coming. That was a long You're diversion welcome. for useless things. But that was thank you. Thanks a lot for coming again. And uh, you know, I really look, look forward to. It. I really look forward to getting to to you another time sometimes about some football stuff. You know. Yeah. Because football is a huge part of my life, and I hope mm. this podcast will be a huge part of the podcast. You know. Yeah. Hopefully, get some players in the future. Obviously, <laughs> not uh, to jinx it or anything. Well, I'll see you in yeah. the Champions League final. Oh yeah, thanks, thank you. When we're at like the opposition. Yes, sides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Each as a coach for like you for like Dynamo Zagreb and me for Ajax. <laughs> the yeah. golden gen- generation for each team. This is we're gonna end. Okay, fuck it. This is a horrible ending, but fuck it. Okay, goodbye. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>